how Errol Flynn almost ended up in jail. Errol Flynn's Illicit Romance Scotty Bowers has kept quiet for 60 years, but now he's talking about bedding the biggest screen icons of the day. Errol Flynn may have been one of the first film stars to learn. The public never forgets. By the mid-1940s, Flynn's career as a matinee idol and swashbuckling film star had dimmed thanks to scandalous reports of alcoholism, womanising and the alleged assault of two underage girls. Even his 1959 death was tinged with salaciousness when he reportedly died in the arms of his teenage girlfriend, Beverly Ardland, a former chorus girl whom Flynn had allegedly begun dating when she was only 15. I'm bewildered. I can't understand it. I hardly touch the girl, said the 33-year-old actor of Hanson as he was released on $1,000 bail. Flynn's proclivities were well known. I like my whiskey old and my women young, he said, more than once. But there also was suspicion that charges had been brought because, in the words of Kenneth Anger in Hollywood Babylon, Warner Brothers, was not coming across with juicy enough kickbacks to local police. The trial quickly became a media circus. Jerry Geisler, Flynn's high-powered lawyer, dredged up dirt on the girl's past that included affairs with married men and abortions. After deliberating for 13 hours, the jury of nine women and three men returned a not guilty verdict. I knew those women would acquit him, said Satterley. They just sat and looked adoringly at him, as if he was their son or something. But the legal ordeal didn't dampen Flynn's appetite for young women. During the trial, he met Nora Eddington, 19, who worked at a snack bar in the court complex and was the daughter of a Los Angeles County Sheriff's captain. Soon she was pregnant and they married in 1944. When he died at 50 in 1959 from a heart attack, Flynn was romancing Beverly Ardland, whom he'd met when she was 15. Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn and Errol Flynn had just one thing in common, apart from being movie superstars. But that one thing wasn't the fairy tale romance that Hollywood falsely spun for the public to keep their images clean, apparently. They both used a handsome young gas station attendant for sex, in Tracy's case personally and in Hepburn's case to procure her lesbian lovers up to 150 of them over a lifetime. This is just one revelation in a controversial memoir to be published later this month by an old man called Scotty Bowers, who was that gas station attendant, but also a gigolo during Hollywood's golden age. He has kept his mouth shut for 60 years, but now he's talking, and how. The result is a list as long as it is glittering of the screen icons he says he bedded and liaisons he arranged, both gay and straight, for the movie business elite in Los Angeles. Bauer's book unveils secrets involving Vivian Lee, Laurence Olivier, Errol Flynn, Cary Grant, Cole Porter, Rock Hudson and Bob Hope for starters, followed by Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, Cecil Beaton. Tennessee Williams, Somerset Maughan, and, more obscurely, Edith Piaf and Brian Epstein. His book is calculated to shock. Some of the sensationalist tales seem incredible, while the many lurid disclosures are unflinchingly detailed. Rumours of his work as a gigolo and a pansexual, post-war version of Hollywood madam Heidi Fleiss, have done the rounds for years, 
and been exchanged faithfully in industry gossip circles. Bowers said he'd kept quiet before because he didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. He declared that he was talking now simply because I'm not getting any younger and all my famous tricks are dead. The truth can't hurt them anymore. One day he gets a call and a voice says, this is Errol Flynn. That gas station of yours has gained quite a reputation. Bowers was thrilled. Flynn wanted to be fixed up with women who both behaved and looked as if they were under age. So Bowers escorted a parade of young women to him. But he mentions in the book's somewhat self-aggrandizing style that Flynn would get so drunk that despite telling them, I'm going to make love to you like nothing you've ever experienced. He would pass out dead drunk and Bowers would oblige the lady myself. In 1961, Ardlin's mother Florence wrote a book about the relationship between her daughter and Flynn called The Big Love. Decades later, Filmmakers Richard Glatzer and Wash Westmoreland, intrigued by the book, tracked down the publicity-shy Beverly Ardland in her Palmdale, California home, managed to gain her confidence, and used her recollections of the May to December romance as the basis for their film, The Last of Robin Hood, which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival. Despite the fact that Beverly rarely gave interviews about her relationship with Flynn, the filmmakers say she gave the project her blessing before her death in 2010. The Last of Robin Hood, which is dedicated to Beverly, stars Kevin Kline as the charismatic ageing Flynn, Dakota Fanning as Beverly, and Susan Sarandon as the aforementioned tell-all authoring stage mother whose own dreams of becoming a dancer were derailed by a car accident that left her paralysed. In the interest of old Hollywood gossip, we've compiled some of the juiciest Last of Robin Hood plot points, which refer to Flynn's illicit romance below. Flynn first notices Beverly rehearsing as a chorus girl at the studio where he is working and summons her to his office via a third party. Shortly after, he invites her to audition for a part, an audition that happens to take place at a producer's home at night. It is during this audition that Flynn takes Beverly's virginity. According to the film, Flynn does not learn that Beverly is 15 years old until later. A stage mum through and through, Beverly's mother does not seem remotely alarmed when Flynn invites her daughter to an audition late at night, despite the fact that Flynn has a reputation as, to use Beverly's father's terms, a walking penis. Although Beverly is unimpressed by Flynn, she eventually succumbs to his charm. Flynn, convinced that Beverly looks like a wood nymph, gives her the pet name Woodsy. Flynn is able to woo Beverly's starstruck mother and even encourage her to tag along on their dates as a third wheel because, as he tells her, he does not want the press to allege something unsavoury. After Beverly's mother discovers that her daughter is sleeping with Flynn, Flynn is able to calm her nerves by promising that he will facilitate an acting career for Beverly. He takes her to an audition for Lolita where he tells director Stanley Kubrick that he and Beverly are a package deal. Obviously, this negotiation tactic does not work out. In addition to drinking round the clock, Flynn begins using IV drugs to settle his back pain following a trip to Africa. At Beverly's 17th birthday party, Flynn announces to friends and family that he and Beverly will be married. He produces a movie in Cuba so that Beverly can star called Cuban Rebel Girls. 
While filming, he falls ill and dictates a living will to Beverly so that she is taken care of in the event of his death. About a year later, while leasing his yacht in Canada so that he can fund his final divorce and marry Beverly, Flynn complains of back pain. Beverly escorts him to a doctor's home in Canada. Alerted that Flynn is en route, the doctor and his wife invite guests over. Upon arriving, Flynn opts to amuse the crowd instead of be treated, regaling them with a story about the time his friends stole John Barrymore's corpse from the mortuary and deposited it in Flynn's living room as a prank. Moments later, Flynn leaves the room saying, I've never felt better, to get some rest. When Beverly checks on him, she finds him dead. The will Beverly transcribed for Flynn is deemed invalid because it does not have a signature. She does not inherit anything from the late actor. Beverly's mother is arrested for public drunkenness afterward and as a consequence Beverly is put into a juvenile home. Her mother is found guilty of contributing to her daughter's delinquency and put in jail for 60 days. Beverly ultimately makes amends with her mother who wrote The Big Love against Beverly's wishes on Florence's deathbed. Recalls Arthur Hiller, 90, who directed Flynn in a 30-minute NBC drama shortly before his death, he was intoxicated and couldn't remember his lines the few days we worked together. He just felt like a nice guy, like a nice guy with a problem. <laughs> 